Hi, everyone. My name is Matt Haynes. I'm an audiobook narrator, and it is my pleasure to have video uh, two of the second part of the Process Project series. This is where I give you folks a peek behind the curtain of my process as a narrator, and then I interview authors as to their process. So I had the pleasure of uh, doing a sample from K.C. Ramsey's work uh, this past week. And uh, the video for that is up and uh, for your enjoyment, uh, both uh, for, for my performance and especially for the author's writing. Um, and now I get to interview the author about her process. So welcome, Casey. Thank you for having me. Uh, so uh, Casey, the focus of the video that I did was on tone and how moods shift within uh, sometimes a single chapter. It can be so easy to, especially when dealing with uh, high volatile emotions in romance, um, as you know, romantic relationships within a book, um, to have uh, just a one note happening throughout a scene. And what I appreciate about really disciplined and accomplished writers is that they are able to shift the tone dynamically throughout a passage so that it's like, oh, okay, this person is gaining ground here and oh, they've lost ground and now things have taken a dive. And now we're about, yeah, maybe a page into things taking a dive, but there is a glimmer of hope here where suddenly they make a connection again. Um, and I, I, I found that in your, in your writing, I found that to be the case. How, how, how do you do it? Do you plan it? Is it coming instinctually to you? Um, d does it, uh, do you flesh those dynamics out even more in the editing process? Uh, well, I'm, I'm definitely not a plotter, so they tend to just happen, to be honest, more often than not. Um, I'm an extremely optimistic type personality. So, you know, my characters might be down and like you said, on a downward spiral, and I have to have something that they can root for and cling to and, and kind of have that little glimmer of hope, like you were talking about, or humor, depending on the situation. Um, you know, I have to have some sort of lighthearted element to bring that back up a little bit. Um, so we might dwell in that for a page or two, but it doesn't stay very long because I am not that kind of person. I have to see, you know, the, the cup is half full or, or, you know, the light at the end of the tunnel, that sort of thing. So it comes back um, that way because I, to me, I always want it to end on a good note or have that glimmer of hope for those characters. Or like I said, whether it be a joke or, you know, a one-liner, it's something that, you know, just lightens the mood up just a little bit. Now, do you find that uh, in your books, uh, when things are going well, uh, particularly, I can imagine, uh, towards the ending of the book, if it's uh, if it's a happy ever after type story, um, uh, and you know the primary conflict seems to be done for uh, for that that book, um, do you still find that to keep things uh, spicy or carbonated, as one would think, um, that you then also insert a little bit of conflict? I do. And you know, it's, it's funny you say that. And in both, I have two books currently published. Um, I have a plan for the entire series. So it's at least six to 10 books right now um, that I kind of have stirring around in my head a little bit. Um, like I said, I, I, I'm not really a plotter, but as things have gone on, I know certain things that are going to happen for the um, overarching um, theme with these books. So um, there's some storylines that continue past the first book and second book and are, are kind of involving the whole family and even beyond into friends and family um, as well. So there's more of that than readers know right now. There's a lot of things in the first book that seem to be wrapped up and we find out in later books that it's not as wrapped up and in, in clean cut and black and white as we thought it was, um, which I love. Like I love having that hint of well, wait, I thought I thought we had this figured out and then coming back and doing a reread and realizing that, mm. you know, there's certain things in that book that people thought were wrapped up or thought, you know, we're all in a nice pretty package that maybe aren't as clear cut as they thought they were. And it's great right now we're going through on editing on book three and, and my editor and I have been going back and forth because there's quite a few things that even she was like, wait a second, hold on, where did this come from? I thought I knew what was going on here. And now I'm seeing this in a completely different light. And that's what I love about books is it's, you know, books you can reread over and over again. And depending on where you are in that story from that author or in your own life, you can look at a book more than one way. 
And uh, I mean, yeah, it's uh, what it, what you're talking about reminds me, you know, when it's like, wait a second, I got to go back and and uh, check this out. Uh, it reminds me of um, what the ancient Greeks said about uh, a perfect dramatic tragedy, which is the ending is both surprising and inevitable, you know, yes. with with hindsight. So you've talked about how uh, there are things that aren't quite as wrapped up as uh, the reader might think. And uh, given that you've got a whole series here, it, you basically get to, because um, uh, you said that, uh, you know, there's there's not as much preparation as there is instinct uh, working on this. Does that sound right? At least with the first one. I'm, I'm yeah. having to clean up my act a little bit as things go on, just to make sure I get everything tied up. Right. Um, but yes, especially with the first one, it, it more just kind of flew across the keyboard in terms of the idea of it and and how it came together and now that i'm dwelling more and more into each individual character and figuring out how everything is fitting together mm -hmm. um it, it's more there's more forethought into it um, than what it was in the beginning but everything ties together and what i love about the books is there's not any cliffhangers when you read the book e each and every one you feel like you read a complete story and you did but mm -hmm. there's always something later that you can kind of come back and look at it in a different way when you're doing mm -hmm. your reread. You know, uh, and one other question that I have is uh, the art of catching the reader up if they happen to uh, just go right to book two or book three without having read books, without having read the previous ones. Mm -hmm. um, do you uh, do you find yourself uh, consciously uh, making references back to the previous books to catch the reader up or again does it come instinctually for you i don't want to say it would be instinctually um i have a wonderful editor and she keeps me on point <laughs> okay. yeah yeah, yeah. Um, Good. i have a tendency to just blaze forward because i just assume everybody has the same information i do and i'll forget you know that that somebody might not have you know read the first book and they've skipped right to the second book mm -hmm. and there's enough there that you know you don't have to read the first book if it doesn't sound like it's you know what you're on your tbr pile today um you know maybe skipping to the second or even the third and then circling back around they can be read you know as standalones but they're definitely much stronger together just because i i always have that standpoint and an assumption that um, I'm bringing the reader along with me for the entire storyline, which to me stretches through the entire family. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just kind of how I think. But the, we definitely have enough information in each book that the reader doesn't feel out of place or left behind at all. Um, and, and that's that's always nice, you know, even from a, a standpoint of, of somebody new that you don't feel like you're lost with the, within the first few pages. Uh, who are some of your influences? Um, you know, I read everything. I read everything from children's books to fantasy to murder mysteries to um, protector romances are obviously my favorite. That's what I write. Um, Chris Michaels has been a huge influence. Um, she's actually one of the, the authors that encouraged me to write and publish. Abby Zanders is a great one. Um, you know, Susan Stoker, Kathleen Brooks. Uh, but I, I read everything. And I, I like to think that I bring a little bit of that influence from all genres into my, my books and my series. Um, there's little bits and pieces that I feel like I pull from cozy mysteries and pull from, you know, the, the, the kids books in terms of uh, an adventure and a happily ever after, you know, all kind of rolled into one romantic suspense adult version. Um, so I, I, I don't know if I could name every single one of them, but there's definitely been some authors that have definitely helped me along the way, especially as a new author, you know, that they always have time for questions and encouragement. And that's what I love about the writing community is yes. everybody is here for everyone. And we all just want everyone to have a great time and enjoy our writing and encourage each other. I mean, isn't isn't that just lovely? You know, where, where, your, uh, where your heroes become your mentors as well. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and uh, viewers, if you don't know, uh, I am a big fan of Chris Michaels <laughs> uh, uh, because uh, Chris Michaels and I have done, uh, goodness, I think uh, just north of 30 books together. Um, and uh, it is a delight. Um, so, you know, um, uh, check out Chris's work, check out uh, KC's work and how uh, how the Chris factor might be a, an influence there. Um, Casey, um have you listened to uh, an audiobook of a text that you've also read visually? Yes, I am a huge audiobook listener. I have a, a 
fairly big commute. It's at least an hour and a half every single day, depending on the time of day and, and how fast I can get away with driving. <laughs> so I, I have quite a bit of books that I have in both um, audio as well as either paperback or e-reader. E -reader. I, I like all formats depending on my mood. And there's a lot of books that I have in, in more than one format. And uh, what is what do you find uh, makes for a good audiobook narration? Have you ever listened to, uh, you know, especially when you're uh, essentially it sounds like leapfrogging between uh, audio and visual? Um, you know, uh, are there any uh, sort of do's and don'ts that you imagine uh, would would apply to to narrators? Like when when you just think, oh my goodness, this really has gone off the rails, or oh my goodness, yes, more of this. And I have I have readers or I have books that some of the time I, I prefer them more in paperback than I do in audio and I have others that I, I will much prefer to reread in audio over you know a print and it has to do a lot with the narration um, and I think a lot of it just has to do with the influence and the amount of um, inflection that the, the narrator puts in the amount of acting that they put in and bringing those characters to life you know reading in a monotone voice or or you know something like that, I just can't get behind, and I, I have mm. to be in it for the story, not the words. And you know, so I need that narrator to bring that story to life for me. Um, otherwise, you know, I'm I'm just as good to to read it on my own. And you know, I, I love that different aspect. And and like we've talked about before, you know, with with books, the great thing about books in general is that every person can read the same book and have a different storyline or a different image of that character or even that scene in their head. And that's what's great about narration is that, you know, you get that take from somebody else's viewpoint reading the same words that you have. And at the same time, you know, what I would offer is that uh, it's it's great that different narrators have different takes on the material as long as they are equally invested in the story itself. Uh, just like you were saying, you know, monotone just ain't going to do it. Um, exactly. but, uh, the narration's but, a lot like acting. If they don't have their yeah. heart into it, you can definitely tell, especially when there's nothing visually to see, you know, the words have to carry the story because that's all that the reader has is, is listening to those words. Exactly. So if you don't have your heart into it, you're, you're definitely going to notice. Well, uh, uh, terrific. Uh, Casey, thank you so much for giving us uh, a peek at your process. Um, and, uh, just uh, to catch people up on the timeline of the books, um, the, the books have uh, been released since when? And uh, when when do we get to uh, get more stories? I had the, so the first book released in January, the second book released just this past May. Um, mm -hmm. The third book, be on the lookout for that in fall. I don't have a definite release date yet, but we are planning around the first week in November. Fantastic, fantastic. Just in time for the holidays as well. Exactly. Yeah. Well, uh, marvelous. And folks, I will have uh, Casey's uh, uh, information in the uh, comments as well, or in the video description. And please do put it in your comments. Um, I'm Matt Haynes, and uh, this has been Casey Ramsey. And um, as your audiobook narrator, I hope that my voice and y'all's ears meet again real soon.